very dark over there where we're heading. Check, check. A few weeks ago, we were in Yacht Haven Marina in Thailand, but we slipped the lines and came all the way to Malaysia and we took in a few anchorages along the way. Just before we show you that, we just want to say a massive thank you to everyone who replied in relation to the last episode in which we lost Millie overboard. I think everyone was relieved to hear that she was safe and I'm happy to report that it's like nothing ever happened. One day before D-Day when we leave the marina. Yesterday I spent the whole day on the deck. That was, you know, that was fun. One little job I've got to do is a little port light, which is, it's leaking. When we pull down the handle, it's supposed to tighten on that. But unfortunately, this little tab is moving like so because this rivet has broken. So uh, the trick normally is to drill this out. It's a little bit tight. It's very difficult to get a drill in there because as you can see, the gap is pretty small. And just a little tip, hang a bag from underneath because that will stop all the uh, aluminium filings from the drill uh, falling on the floor into Lizzie's food. Lizzie's food? <laughs> Millie's food. Done. We've just left, we've left the marina, we've left Yacht Haven Marina. It's a feeling of relief, release and peace. We're hoping that this means we won't have to go back to a marina for quite some time now. We've got plenty of wind, sails are out, we've got the tide behind us too, so we're just enjoying it while we can. Off we go. It's 5.30, it's a new moon, so it means it's a spring tide. Thought we'd come into the Paradise Club, which is this rather splendid little beach resort on the east side of uh, Yao, Yao Noi Ko. You can see down there channel markers to tell us how to get in. We've just come in on the dinghy at low water and successfully managed to hit two or three rocks already. Liz has found a deep bit in the water. Yes, yeah, right to the bottom. We're in the right bed, but it's, it's trying to know which bit. <laughs> anyway, we're just gonna row, it's all right. And you've got to get to there. Go on then. It's a real jungle, isn't it? I like this because it's the only place in the whole bay. It's this tiny little boutique resort. Not really getting anywhere on my own here. <laughs> got the current against me. Oh no, I've got the current with me, haven't I? Probably if we sat here for long enough, we'd just drift. But I did just want to come over to this side of the anchorage just to show you how beautiful it is here. And of course, sweeping up through the valley there, all the steam that's coming off the, the dense hot foliage from the day. But I think it's time to walk down to the bar and get ourselves a non-alcoholic drink. See you later.
one of the issues of year-round sailing in the tropics is that you have to contend with the damp period. Liz has been complaining that the cabin has been smelling like a sweaty old man's changing room. And that has nothing to do with me, honest. Unfortunately, we still have a leak coming down the mizzen mast. It's the AIS aerial that feeds down into the top of the mast. There's a little lip there. I for completely forgot about it and I think it's open and that is what is leaking. Good. Engines off, cells are out. Liz is happy. That's the main thing. Yeah. Uh, but most importantly, little pussy cat. So yeah, we actually have some sun plodding along here. I'm not going particularly fast. Just sort of four and a half, hitting five knots. But then we don't have much of a mainsail out. It's really just the headsail doing all the work. Sort of approximately ten knots. Perfectly respectable. It's just a slow saunter down to PP. You can see both PPs there. PP Don, which is the main one to the left, and then PP Lee or PP Lay, as some people call it, which is to the right. We promised you our thoughts on selecting the perfect liveaboard cruiser boat. Part one coming up now. Here it is, the episode you've been waiting for. How to buy the perfect liveaboard boat. There is no such thing as the perfect liveaboard boat. Well said, there really isn't. Buying a boat as a liveaboard boat, at least, is all about compromise. There really is no such thing as a perfect liveaboard boat, but you can get pretty close to it, and we're going to discuss that. Well, the processes that we went through to end up buying Esper. Yeah, so probably the first thing that we had to think about was money. Money is always the first thing you have to think about. So we had to decide how much we had to spend and then how we would spend it. Hold back 25% of your total budget to be spent on the boat after you've purchased it. Because invariably there will be things that you'll need to change on the boat. There may be some repairs to do. You may want to add some things as well. Bear this in mind. Don't blow your whole budget on the boat. So that really comes back to what's your total budget. Decide that and then you can work out if you found your boat whether you can really afford it once you look at all the different things you've got to do to it. First thing we did was we got our budget and then we looked at the kind of boat we wanted to get. So the next thing you have to do is decide what you're going to do on your boat. Are you going to go across oceans? Are you going to be doing some really heavy sailing? Or are you going to just stay along the coasts of a certain area? We can categorise a liveaboard boat as either a blue water cruiser boat or the more lightweight production boats. A blue water cruiser boat is going to be a, generally a heavier boat and it's pretty much geared up for offshore heavy weather sailing like oyster for example amals halberg rassi swedens nyad swans whereas the lighter production boats are really geared up for weekend cruising coastal hopping and more importantly for entertaining which is why they've got very big cockpits benetos the genos the bavarias we know people that have sailed around the world on lightweight production boats and we know people that coastal hop on blue water cruisers. We definitely wanted a blue water cruiser because we imagined ourselves going across oceans quite a lot, didn't we? Indeed, yeah. If you go for a blue water cruiser, they do tend to be, on the whole but not always, centre cockpits. And if you have a centre cockpit boat like Esper, you'll find that the cockpit area is much smaller than those lighter weight boats that Jamie was discussing. Are you going to be spending much of your time entertaining more than two people. One of the advantages of the production boats is that they have huge cockpits. Blue water cruiser boats are generally heavier and they are stronger as well so they're more likely to have an encapsulated keel for example. You'll find that the production quality of the production lightweight boats aren't as good as a heavy blue water cruiser and this is one reason why blue water cruisers are generally more expensive. Should I get a fast sailboat and sacrifice a bit of cabin space so that I can get to the destination faster? We love the journey, we love the sailing, we love being out in the open water. But to a lot of people, they want to get to the next destination quicker so they can crack open that beer quicker. That question only you can answer. If you were to do it again, would you buy a brand new boat and not have to deal with the uncertainties of not knowing the history of an old boat? Well, firstly, we couldn't afford a new boat. It was as simple as that. It just came down to economics. Secondly, buying a new boat is like buying a new car and uh, it depreciates immediately. Thirdly, I don't see the logic in buying a, a new boat. There are so many good condition second-hand boats out there that you'd be able to pick up for half the price of a new boat. A good surveyor will be able to identify any issues with the boat that you may have to tend to. And the results of the survey of course can ref 
reflect in your offer. You can reduce your offer to offset having to put in new sales engines and so forth. It's all negotiable when it comes to buying a boat. Another thing to consider is what kind of construction, GRP, aluminium, steel, wood, carbon fibre, ferrous cement. As liverboard, you probably want to avoid wood. Yes, wooden boats are very romantic, but they really are a labour of love. They involve a lot of work. Carbon fibre, of course, forget that, way too expensive. Ferrous cement is really the preserve of those building their own boats in their back garden. So that really leaves steel, GRP and aluminium. Aluminium on paper seems to be a very good compromise between GRP and steel. It's strong, but it's also light. I was put off by aluminium boats by the electrolysis issue. To my mind, they just seem a little bit more hassles. So if I were to give advice, I would say go for either a GRP boat or a steel boat because the two materials are very easy to work on. What do you reckon is the smallest a couple can live on in comfort, 34 foot? Well, we know people that live on 34 foot boats and ironically, the men on the boats are well over six foot. So it can be done. I think probably the biggest that we know of actual liverboards living as couples is maybe up to 60 foot. Uh, Libby Purvis, I remember, wrote an article about starting small and working your way up in order to gain confidence. I think it's almost the other way around. If you launch yourself into a much bigger boat, it's what you get used to, and you really do get used to whatever boat you end up buying. Marina fees go up normally with the size of your boat. It is nice to have a little bit of extra room, but it's not essential. And like a woman's handbag, you expand to fit the size of the object. This is what we like. This is downwind sailing. The wind's coming from right over there. Well, you can see we've got all the sails out. We don't get the stay sail out when we go downwind. It doesn't really do anything. And we're doing about, about five and a half to six knots. I've said it many times, but it's the Southwest monsoon and this is pretty good weather for sailing. And by the way, I should add that uh, American's only ahead of us because he's had his engine on. <sighs> Truth is we've had our engine on as well. dramatic as you can see me now this is Koh Lanta and it's uh, covered in cloud rain and that's what's just passed over us <laughs> we've got a very messy looking mainsail uh, I need to just pull out the outhaul on that and then just behind me you can see the force or the Yankee there's not much out at all really that was basically an entire front So we're still walking down the jetty, this is uh, Old Town. As you can see, the tide is on its way out. It's still receding. And you can see that when the water comes in, it actually comes in up to the little jetties at the end of all the restaurants. So you can imagine trying to bring your uh, dinghy in here. It ain't gonna happen. Like we're gonna eat it. Try. since we did some food shopping and we're slowly running out of fresh stuff. Fortunately, there is this very, very little wet market here. As 
Liz was trying to say just then, we've left Lanta. And, uh, we're going to do a 15, 16 mile hop straight down. We've got the wind right behind us at the moment, so the head sails flopping around a little. It was a bit quiet coming out of here. The wind wasn't very good, but the wind's better now. We were just hitting 17 knots on the broad reach. We were topping six and a half knots. We're catching up Americans. We got fed up with the uh, flapping foresail, so we thought we'd run goose wing, which we haven't done for ages. Sometimes when you run goose wing, you use the spinnaker pole to pole out uh, the foresail, but the wind is in just the right direction. It really is right up our bum. It means that uh, we now have the mainsail that side, our headsail this side, but most importantly, American on synchronicity is struggling over there and we are overtaking him so fast, <laughs> you can barely see him. We caught a fish, and this is his. Uh, this Body. is the meat that he's given us. He's Very nice. going in the pot, and we're going to eat him tonight. We are going to eat him tonight. Finally. Bloody brilliant. Yeah. yeah. That's what living on a boat's all about, eh? Eating fish. Mm -hmm. Yes. Catch fish, eating fish, kill fish. We just need to sort out the catch catching fish part. <laughs> <laughs> What's wrong with you? What do you just do? Put a fish on his head. Feeling a bit rough around the edges, I'll be honest. Last night was our last night with American, and so we had a fun evening, but uh, perhaps one too many bottles of wine. But anyway, good weather, look at this. Wispy clouds, blue sky. It's very dark over there where we're heading. Got to keep an eye on that because although the wind blows this way, sometimes these southerly squalls can come up very quick. There's a whole load of fishing boats that are anchored in the lee of Cradang, and that always makes us suspicious. As Liz says, do they know something we don't know? Journey's end for the day. Quite an exhilarating, exhilarating, exhilarating uh, sail. Back to our discussion on choosing the perfect livable boat. Here's part two. Remember, you're going to be living on this boat, but you're also going to be working on it as well. So there's a few key things to look out for. The first is engine access. Some boats I've been on, the engine would require a contortionist in order to change the fuel filter. That's something you're going to be changing every season or so. So just bear this in mind. Another aspect of the boat that you're going to be spending quite a bit of time in, depending on your culinary persuasions of course, is the galley. We like our galley because it has a very narrow corridor that runs through it. This basically means that in rough weather we can actually lean against that and still work in the galley. Everything is to hand, everything is, is simply within reach. Yeah, we've done a few passages now which have been really, really rough, but we've still been able to go downstairs, make tea, noodles, spaghetti, something simple. The cabin, the first thing is that we needed headroom. The second thing was is that we have enough space in the cabin that both of us could be in there changing and getting ready. The third thing, of course, is that the bed was big enough. Practicality does outweigh beauty, I think. One of the traps that a lot of people fall into is thinking that when they buy their boat, they're going to be entertaining, have family and friends come over to visit all the time and so they put great emphasis on how many cabins are on the boat. Truth be told you won't get so many people coming out to visit as you were hoping unless of course you're extremely popular. Don't get too bogged down in thinking about a boat that's going to accommodate lots and lots of people. Having a whole spare cabin that is just spare for now and again is just crazy. Our four peak is a double cabin but it's not anymore. It's a brilliant storage area. <laughs> and we also have two bunks on the starboard side. Again, they are storage areas, but they, we have left the beds in there so we can use them if necessary. But mostly, when people visit us, they sleep in the saloon. You have to think about the underside of the boat, not just what it looks like from the top. Long kills, bulb kills, fin kills, bolt-on kills, encapsulated kills. There are pros and cons to the different types of kills. Some you may find don't go into a stern as well, but I think more importantly it's worth thinking about whether you have a bolt-on kill or an encapsulated kill. Encapsulated kills on the whole are safer. The other thing to think about is the skeg. Essentially a skeg is uh, an extra piece uh, that comes down off the bottom of the hull and it hangs in front of the rudder. Okay, it's probably time to bring up that old chestnut, cat versus mono. Did we ever consider a cat? 
The answer's no. Why is that, Jamie? They are very spacious. They're light and they're fast. They have a very simple rig. However, I did a delivery on a cat across uh, the west coast of Africa. We hit some nasty weather and we were beating into wind. And I have to say, it was the single most uncomfortable journey I have ever done. And this is the da- one of the downsides of a catamaran, is that there are certain points of wind that it will struggle with. Since we're on the subject of downsides of catamarans, let's just list a couple of other ones. You've got two engines, not one. So that's twice the amount of work to do with. Of course, there are advantages to this as well, because you have contingency, I suppose. Financially, it can be really expensive to keep them up. But certainly, if you put them into marina, you're usually paying twice as much as a mono. Yes, and also the hard standing and the haul-out charges are going to be more expensive. There is another key thing for a liverboard consideration, and that is the weight. We met a guy who was in a boatyard, he was explaining how he had just installed an ICOM 802 SSB radio and he said to me I've installed this on the starboard hull and I know it weighs eight kilograms I now have to offset this eight kilos on the port side weight is a crucial factor on catamarans of course they are really expensive in the first place so they were completely beyond our budget if you can afford a catamaran and you're interested in hacking up and down the coast very very quickly then it's a good option and you've got lots and lots of space So to summarise what we've been saying here, we've been talking very much from our own perspective and what we've learned over the years. But there are a few points that we just would like to say once again. Be prepared to travel. Once you've decided the kind of boat that you want and you've narrowed it down, have a look not just where you live but anywhere in the world. There are boats for sale everywhere and often you can get a really good bargain on the other side of the world and it might be a great place to start your adventure. See and sail as many boats as possible. Get in touch with as many brokers as possible and get on as many boats as possible. Let brokers take you on to bigger boats than you were planning to look onto, or smaller boats even, and boats of different layout that didn't necessarily tick the boxes that you're looking for. And use the broker's knowledge. There are good brokers and there are bad brokers, we all know that, but they are usually knowledgeable. And if they know that you are serious and that you do want to buy a boat, work with them, pick their brains and get them to help you. You will have to compromise on some things. For example, we were looking for a fully slabbed sloop and we ended up with an in-mast furling catch. It doesn't seem to have affected our lives too much. Research, 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 as well as looking at the boats. Go online, go in forums, ask questions, talk to people like us. There are a number of blogs out there. Get people to give you their advice. There's so much information on the internet now. Do your homework. Take all their opinions on board, but ultimately go with your gut feel. I think it's fairly obvious from this that there is no answer and that it's all about horses for courses. Goodbye Petra. It was uh, a windy experience. Uh, We're hoping that uh, we're going to have slightly less wind than we did yesterday, but the forecast is for uh, a little bit of rain around about one o'clock, which means we'll probably still be sailing. was a tremendous sail today. We hit the highest speed for years. We got 9.9 Taratau. Completely desolate, wild, nobody lives there. And it was the first ever marine park in Thailand. Been going for years. It's what Liz does all day. Especially when we're motor sailing and not doing much on the boat. Like today, this is uh, Liz in her element. There's a pun there about playing with our tackle, but uh, it's still too early in the morning to think of it. Millie's testing the line for me. We're now in Malaysian waters. We have left Thai waters and uh, we're approaching the northeastern tip of Langkawi, which is down here. 
Um, we're going to take you through a very narrow little channel. It gets very shallow, but we're on a neap tide and we're sort of mid tide at the moment, so it should be okay. The most exciting news is that we ran the water maker as we have been doing for the last few weeks and uh, we've just filled up our tanks. Water was overflowing, so we made the most of it and we both had jolly good washes, didn't we? Good showers. We're the cleanest we've been for about three weeks. We don't even smell. No. Big shout out to Phil Bender who came over and helped us with that fixing of the, the new part for the water maker. Thanks Phil. Sails are down, there's absolutely no wind. No wind at all. Anyway, got to go. We've reached our waypoint and we now have to navigate through this tricky channel. So we'll uh, catch you in a bit. And here we are, right now in real time in Kwa Harbour on Langkawi. Don't forget, if you've got any questions, then please post them in the comments down below and we're gonna try our best to answer them as much as we can. So I was at Pee Pee Island and I saw this fisherman, Thai fisherman, who kept coming back to the shore with tons of fish. And of course, when we're out here sitting around and we're dragging lures behind the boat, yeah. we think there's no fish in the water. This yeah. guy was the clear proof that we are just doing it wrong. And so he, I asked him what he was doing and he gave me this. Uh -huh. So this is a treble hook linked to two single hooks. And he, and he showed me that you stick a live fish on the first hook. Yeah. And then this last one is called a stinger. And uh, it smells disgusting. Oh, like, don't like do my... that. And, and that is, that's proof oh, of how good no, it is. Oh, no, we didn't even use that. Oh, Jamie, <laughs> that's horrible. Horrible. <laughs> 